All right. Good morning, B Church. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. I am super excited to be with you all today. If you have not met me before, I'm Emmanuel Escobar, the discipleship pastor here at Beach. Uh, hey, listen, before I get into the message, um, during our time of worship, I, feel the, I felt the Holy Spirit impress something on me that I wanted to share with you all. Um, as you know, 2023, if you've been here, if you're new, come along and just ride with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, 2023 has really been a year of development for this church. I shared with that from the stage before of just how, how thankful I was to see the spiritual depth and development that I have seen in so many of you. In a year that started behind in finances, we have consistently pushed the envelope in generosity. In a year that started with a shortage of life group leaders, we have ended up with more life group leaders than we ever before. You have has consistently pressed into the Holy Spirit and been rewarded with growth and development. And I've encouraged you guys from this stage before saying, great job, keep running, keep going. What I felt the Holy Spirit impress on me during worship was that you are now reaching a stage in your development where some of you are coming across old dead roots that need to be pulled up. And this isn't a matter of legalism. I'm not asking you to stop watching rated R movies because they're rated R, right? Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there is that thing that I just said that, that comment about dead roots and you, you knew exactly what I was talking about. There are dead roots that are getting in the way of you drawing deeper into communion in the presence of the Lord. And God wants to tell you that there is grace for you. God wants to tell you that there is power for you. And if you would be willing to pull up those old roots that have been getting in the way, he will continue to reward you with a deeper and deeper relationship with him and fruit that bears and feeds others. Amen? Amen? So let's do this, church. Yes, God's good. That's what, that's what the, 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 ref, the word refers to this as prophecy, by the way. Prophecy is not me telling you the world will end next week, right? Like, no, prophecy is, is, is when a person shares from the Spirit of God for building up the church. And that's what just happened, if you're curious to what that was. Uh, I'm not any holier than you. You're just as capable of experiencing this by yielding to the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you pull up those old roots, you will begin to experience more and more of those giftings of the Holy Spirit. So let's do this, church. Let's pray, one, uh, for the message. I was in Costa Rica all week, so I didn't have any of my usual prep time. So <laughs> pray that it's good. And... <laughs> But two, or primarily I should say, let's pray for what I just talked about. Let's pray for us to yield to the Holy Spirit and allow him access to the parts of us that out of self-preservation we have said, not yet, Lord. Not this. This is too painful. That we give him access to those things. He's worthy of your trust. I know it's scary and I know it hurts, but I'm telling you, if anybody, if anybody is trustworthy enough to handle that thing that causes pain, it's him. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your justice, Lord. Holy Spirit, thank you for the depth that you've developed in this body named Beach Church. Thank you for the depth that you've developed in our people in our Jack's campus, our people in our online campus, Lord. Thank you for the development and spiritual walk that you've built on them, Lord. As we continue to press towards you, we inevitably run into the old things, old habits that keep getting in the way. Holy Spirit, we pray that we yield to you, that we're willing to entrust you, Lord. Holy Spirit, open hearts today that are willing to take their hand off that thing that they have been guarding this whole time. Holy Spirit, that when we yield to you, that we draw deeper, that we heal, that we see you restore. 
And that that old root that we pulled out simply becomes another part of our story that encourages others to press forward and encounter you and see how amazing, kind, and full of love you are. Holy Spirit, have your way in our church. Have your way in me, Lord. Have your way in everything that we do here, including this message today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God is good, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, he, he is kinder and better than we deserve. Um, I aim to say that at least three times a day. Um, he's way better than we deserve. Um, today we're continuing Agape, our series on serving like Jesus. This is week three. Week one, Pastor Jerry started by very eloquently telling us the right place to launch, which is the only way for us to serve people with the love of the Father is by being with the Father. Pastor David did an excellent job on week two in reminding us that everything we do, we ought to do with joy and for the service of others. And as I was praying, Lord, how do we end up this series I realized that I wanted to talk about something very specific, which was purpose. I wanted to talk about purpose because I firmly believe that we ought to live out of purpose, not obligation. I say that because there might be many of you working very hard for the kingdom of God out of obligation, not out of purpose. And here's the thing, we just did a whole series on serving, right? And if the only thing you walk away with is you need to be busy, we have immensely miscommunicated the heart of the Father. If the only thing you walk away with in a series about serving like Jesus is, boy, I need to do more things, we have missed it. I don't believe that the way that we please our God is by being busy. I don't believe that the way that we please our king is by simply doing more. What makes you a good believer is not being a busy believer, contrary to what our culture and oftentimes religion will say. So as I was speaking to the Lord about this, it's like, God, what is it you want me to bring this up? Get busy was not the message. Find your purpose was the message. Because I firmly believe that we have to live out of purpose, not obligation. Part of the things that we do here at Beach, the reason that we are emphasizing on being before doing over and over and over again is because we want you to understand this concept. We don't want you to serve because we need to plug in a hole. We don't want you to serve because we don't have anyone else to help. We want you to serve because you feel purpose leading you to take that step. The reality is that purpose fuels you and recharges you. Obligation drains you and wears you out. There might be some of you that are feeling this way. Serving in kids ministry, waiting for the class to be over so you can call it a day. Being at a charity event, looking at the clock going, is it time yet? Can I go home? And if you're doing so, you're doing so out of obligation, not purpose. Now, does this mean that you're doing the thing you're not supposed to be doing? Maybe. It could be that you're simply serving outside of your purpose. It could also be that you have started to serve and forgotten why you're serving. You could be very much meant to be in that kid's classroom. But over time, you have distanced yourself from the heart of the Father. Therefore, this is no longer purpose. It is now obligation. And if we truly want to live out agape, if we truly want to live out the heart of our Father, 
then we must yield ourselves to him that we may identify his purpose. The reason I say this, the reason I say that we must yield to him is because there's many of you that are hearing me right now, perhaps young people specifically that are going, dog, I have no idea why I'm here. I have no idea. I don't know what my purpose is, man. Thank you for echoing my mom and my dad that are constantly nagging me about finding out what I'm supposed to be doing. Listen to me. Listen to me. The reason that so many of us can run aimlessly in our lives is because we try to find purpose on feeling good, and feeling good can only last so long. We try to find our purpose on doing for others because that sounds good and kind and we should do that. And then that quickly, that purpose turns into obligation that drains you, not that fuels me and recharges me. The only way that we can find purpose is is found in communion with God. The only way purpose can be found is in communion with God. This is why we are obsessed over being before doing. We're obsessed with it. Because we truly believe that the only way you can know why you were meant to be on this earth is by spending time with your father in communion. God doesn't call us to be busy. He calls us to be obedient. And how can you possibly be obedient if you haven't spent any time with him? Listen to me, y'all. We're coming out of this series, and I don't want you guys all to, okay, one, two, three, scatter, run, and get busy. What I would love to see is one, two, three, scatter, run to a place of intimacy with God. And we we say, Lord, why am I here? And how can I serve that purpose? You can do all the quizzes online all day to see what you were meant to do and, and match your personality traits and your anagram to see, I should be a social worker. You can do that all day long. But you want to know where true purpose is found? Communion with God. That is the only way. In fact, if you dare to do for God without communing with God, you could be in a lot of danger. I firmly believe this. I firmly believe that doing for God without being with God will lead you to sin. I know, I know, I know. Doing for God without being with God will lead you to sin. It will inflate your ego. It will inflate your pride. You will begin like the Pharisees, begin to look down your nose at other people that are doing less. Doing for the, for the kingdom of God will only lead you to sin. You don't believe me? Check this out. Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, huh. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Do you realize that you could be immensely busy for the Lord doing many mighty works and the answer from your king will still be, who are you? These are red letter words. This is Jesus speaking. This isn't some third folded commentary with an opinion. These are the words from our Lord. And he is telling you, you can be so busy doing for me that you don't know me. This is heartbreaking. 
listen to me, y'all. These people are casting out demons. They're prophesying what I just did earlier today. They're prophesying. And they don't know the Lord. That is heavy. That is heartbreaking. Doing without being with God will only lead you to sin. This is why we're obsessed with being before doing. Because we don't want to just shoot or shot and get busy and hopefully things will go well. We want to be with our Father, hear His purpose, and obey Listen to me. There are many ministries out there burn out of bitterness. There are many ministries out there birth out of anger and rebellion. There are many pastors out there pastoring out of rebellion and bitterness and anger, not from being with the Lord. There are many people working in kids' ministry. There are many people opening doors. There are many people serving at their jobs, doing great, mighty things for the Lord that don't know Him. This is heavy. I know. It's heavy for me. That's called conviction. And that's a good thing. Now, don't let it turn into shame. That's not from the Lord. Shame will tell you you are not good enough. Shame will tell you you will never rise above this. Shame will tell you that is you who he's talking about, and you will never know the Lord. That is shame. That is not conviction from the Lord. Shame will tell you you are not enough, and you'll never be enough. Conviction tells you I have called you to something higher. Conviction tells you, leave behind your old ways so I can show you something better. Conviction tells you that is where you're starting, not where you're ending. Do not let conviction turn into shame. Conviction is full of hope because when I am convicted, I know I have a father that loves me. I know I have a father that will not give up on me. I know I have a father that does not want to leave me in darkness. Instead, calls me into light. Praise God for conviction. May I always experience it because that is when I know I am close to the heart of my king. Welcome conviction. Let it check you. Let it ask you the hard questions and let it lead you to life. Oh, good Lord, I do not want to be a person that is so busy doing that I don't know him. Busyness is a trap of the enemy designed to keep you obsessed with achievement designed to keep you obsessed with ego, designed to keep you obsessed with keeping track and keeping record, so busy, in fact, that you're too busy to spend time with the Lord. Listen, y'all, I've been in ministry over a decade now. I can't tell you how many times I have felt in that place. Lord, I am too busy doing mighty works for you to give you the time of day. Lord, I am too busy preparing for my message. Lord, I am too busy having to counsel these people. Lord, I am too busy to be with you. I've done that so many times and never once has that worked out well for me. Never once. Never once has that actually developed health or growth in people. It only developed bitterness and hatred and anger. Never once. It is so easy to hide behind the shield of busyness to excuse our lack of communion. Yet communion is why you're here. You're not called to be busy. You're called to be with him. I have a wonderful friend. She always tells me this, and I love it every time she reminds me. She says, Emmanuel, don't forget you're a human being, not a human doing. I love that. I love that. 
It centers me. I'm, uh, I, I don't know my, my, my personality type, to be honest. I'm not very good at those things. Uh, but I'm, I know that I'm very driven, right? That I love to achieve. I love to build. It's one of my favorite things to take something from zero to 100. Ah, the best. So fulfilling. Because of that, I can have the tendency to be obsessed with the doing and the building and forget about the communion that the Lord has called me into. So if doing without being will lead me into sin, then being and doing coming out of that leads you into life. This is one of the biggest traps of the enemy to somehow convince you that the more you do, the more proud the Lord will be of you. That if you want to grow, right? I just got done talking about how we're growing and we're developing, right? That if you want to grow, you got to do. Now, don't mishear me. Oftentimes, your growth, your spiritual growth will be tied to to you taking action, you taking leadership, you showing up and saying, where are the chairs I can pick up, right? Oftentimes, it will. But the doing is not what's causing maturity. The maturity is what was causing the doing. It starts with communion. I am sorry, but the Lord is not any more proud of you than he was the moment that you said, Jesus, come into my heart. You want to know how I know that? Because the Lord was not any more proud of Jesus when he died on the cross for you than when he went to get baptized. These are the words that were spoken about Jesus by the Holy Spirit, and then we'll declare to, oh, wait, never mind that. Well, that. This is my dear lo- dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Jesus had not done a single miracle. Jesus had not done anything quote unquote useful. He had simply been with the Father, heard his purpose, and took steps to fulfill it, and that simple action was enough for the Lord to say, you bring me great joy. Listen to me, I have a son, he's seven years old, about to be a dynamite of a child. I love that man with all of my heart. And it can be so easy for me to fall into the default that I grew up with, which was I need to achieve in order to make mom proud. My father left us at a very early age, and very much I felt that the reason that he did was because I wasn't worthy of him sticking around. You want to know one of the biggest hurdles I've had to overcome in my marriage is the constant fear that my wife will leave me the moment I drop the ball. The moment I don't achieve, the moment I don't succeed, the moment I don't accomplish, she will go find someone else. These are all roots from the enemy that have no place in our heart. So with my son, I've taken steps to ensure that he knows that I am proud of him and that he gives me great joy, not for any of his achievements, simply because he is. Simply because he is a gift to my life. His presence brings me joy. I love hearing him laugh and cackle. I love seeing the things that he's interested in. I love his weird little humor. I love being around that little maniac. The Lord feels the same way about you. You don't need to do anything to make him proud. You don't need to do anything to make him feel great joy towards you. He feels it towards you because he loves you. Because you are. This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. I was once pastored by this man named Matt Evans in Dalton, Georgia. And one thing that he said all the time that I loved, he would say, the Lord does not speak in the frequency of busy. The Lord does not speak 
in the frequency of busy. This spoke so deeply into my heart that I literally had it written down on my board the whole time I worked for that man. The Lord does not speak in the frequency of busy. Busyness will distract you from being with the Lord. Doing without being with the Lord will lead you into sin, thinking that you have somehow earned his attention, not realizing that he's already deeply pleased with you. Apostle Paul said this, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us all along. So here's the thing. He's deeply pleased with us already, right? He's already pleased with who we are because we are his. We have given our life to him. But nonetheless, he has planned good things for us to do all along. This is where the serving part comes. This doesn't deny the good work that God is in you. Listen, out in their lobby, we have a partner today named Daniel. They have a heart for foster kids. They love them. They do everything to care for those kids. And if you have a heart like them, go out there and connect with them. Listen, what they're doing is not wrong. It is very much from the Lord. So how then do we manage being called to act while also not being driven by ego and obligation? We live in purpose. Sabbath is a way that we identify what that purpose is. You want to find your purpose. You want to find what you burn for. You want to find exactly what are the good works that you were placed on this earth to do long ago. Practice Sabbath. Now, for you, some of these might be very foreign to you. What in the world is Sabbath? Sabbath, as is defined by Scripture, is 12 hours set aside for communion with the Lord, communion with those you love, and communion with yourself. Now, I understand that I am standing on a giant pile of privilege by telling you to take 12 hours of your week To set them aside and do nothing but commune with God, commune with those you love, and commune with yourself. I understand that. I recognize that. Take the steps to create those 12 hours now. You may not have them immediately. I understand some of you might be running an entire household by yourselves. I understand some of you may be running three different jobs to pay for said household. I understand where you can. Create intentional space every week for you to commune with God, commune with those you love, and commune with yourself. Listen, you guys just got got done hearing my story of how I grew up and the things that I have to deal with. You want to know how I broke those? About two and a half years, three years ago, I started a journey of Sabbath. I started a journey of saying, you know what, the world doesn't need me. For 12 hours, I can put things down. I do not exist. The only reason that I'm alive is to commune because I'm a spirit, I'm a human being, not a human doing, right? And I started carving out. It started just a few hours every Saturday. Then it started to grow. It has shifted over time. Now my Sabbath happens on Friday because working at a church, things are different. My Sabbath happens on a Friday. For some of you, Sunday might be the perfect Sabbath. Coming to church, communing with the Lord, going to lunch with your family, communing with each other. You know what you should do after that? A great Sabbath practice? Nap. <laughs> Nap. The holiest thing you can do sometimes is nap. Don't forget, I never always mix them up. I don't know if it's Elijah or Elisha, but in the Old Testament, one of those two men is struggling, about to kill himself. And the Lord's advice is literally, dude, eat something and nap. That's literally what the Lord tells him to do. Sabbath. Set time aside that you may commune with God. What does that look like? This isn't about legalism. Remember, the Lord tells us that the Sabbath is here to serve man, not man to serve the Sabbath. So this isn't about legalism. 
If for you, Sunday morning, being here, going to lunch with family, and then going home and taking a nap is Sabbath, do it. For me, it looks like sitting in my hammock, staring at trees, listening to worship music. I'm in my word when my son sometimes comes in. Listen, sometimes that's the only time my kid gets to see me open my Bible. We have very different schedules. Oftentimes he's out of the door before I am. Sometimes I'm out of the door before he is. Sabbath is the only time that he gets to see an example of what being with the Lord looks like. For many of you families, this could be a great way for you to begin an establishment of not, let me show you how to do this, but hey, come with me. I'm figuring this out too. How do I commune with this ancient of days, this force, this power that has cemented the, the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth? How can I interact with this deeply spiritual being that stands outside of time? Yes, is that spiritual? Yes, it's that deep. I'm telling you, Sabbath will change your life. We want, if you want to find your purpose, practice Sabbath. Another thing that you can do, ask yourself, what do you enjoy? Some of you may be feeling trapped in what you do, and it's not what you enjoy. Listen, God made you. We believe that, right? That's why we're so, like, pro-life, right? Is that, did I say that right? Yeah, pro-life, right? Like, because we believe that God created us from inception, right? We believe that the Lord values us from inception. And somehow when we, like, grow up, we fail to believe that anymore. All of a sudden, everybody fends for themselves. And if you have a miserable job, well, that's how it is. Are we valuable or not? Do you have value or not? What is it, the thing that the Lord has placed in you that you love? Pursue that. That may not be a paid job. That's fine. I was bivocational for years. Mike and Lori will tell you that. I did this job for free for many, many years because this is why I'm here. This is why I'm placed by the Lord to do. I love this. Whether it pays me or not, this was my purpose that I pursued. What do you enjoy? Lastly, seek counsel. Let somebody speak into your life. There might be things about you that you don't see. And you may think, I need to be this thing because that's what I've always wanted to do. And then someone goes, dude, you're great with kids. Have you ever thought being a teacher? And just letting that speak into you might be just enough to pivot you. I want to share with you guys a story briefly about a man that is living this out. Uh, we just got back from Costa Rica. We had a great time. Uh, Pastor David and I got to meet this man uh, maybe two years ago, if I'm thinking of that timeline right. His name is Edgar. Edgar is uh, the world's most interesting man. <laughs> if you guys can tell by the swagger and the FJ Cruiser that he has, he is who I want to be when I grow up. Uh, dude is amazing. He owns a coffee plantation in Costa Rica, and this place is like the Garden of Eden. I mean, I'm telling you, this place is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, there is fruits growing everywhere. Fruits I had never tried are there in display for people to enjoy and eat. Edgar takes deep pride into his work. His entire orchard of coffee, I don't know if you call it an orchard farm, I don't know. His entire plantation, we'll go with that, of coffee is completely eco-sustainable. It has zero carbon footprint, and he's so proud of that. His coffee is so excellent that George Clooney, yes, that George Clooney, flew a helicopter onto a soccer field so that he can go to his plantation, taste his coffee, and hence selected as the provider for his famous Nescafe that he sells. That is the level of excellence that this man lives to. Here's the wonderful thing about this man. All those things that I just mentioned, I learned by walking around his farm and talking to his kids. Do you want to know the only thing he talked about? I am doing exactly what I am meant to do. 
this isn't mine. This is the Lord's. He's just letting me hold it and trusting me with it. And when he calls me to give it back to him, I will gladly do so. He will talk about walking amongst those coffee beans and spending time in the presence of God. He has worked in that coffee plantation since he was a child. Saved up enough money, helped his father purchase it. Eventually, he inherited it from his father. All his other siblings bailed. They said, I don't want to do coffee work anymore. They ran. He took time to say, Lord, why am I here? And he felt deeply convicted that the reason he was on this earth was to protect that plot of land and to bring life not just to the earth, but to anybody that encounters it. And let me tell you something. You spend any moment, any amount of time with this man, you don't see a tired old man that's been working a coffee plantation since childhood. You see a man full of purpose. You see a man that loves the Lord, that has spent time with him and has no qualms understanding why he was put on this earth. A man that has been with the Lord. And out of being with him, has found his doing. Church, let's not go out there and get busy. Let's go out there and find our purpose. Because when we find our purpose, we will truly be able to serve with agape. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, we give you our life and we thank you for everything that you are. Thank you for giving us purpose and a reason for being, Lord. Thank you that you're pleased with us from the beginning. Holy Spirit, I pray that Beach Church won't be a busy church, won't be a church with people just plugging in holes, but a church full of purpose-driven people that has been with you first and out of being with you have identified the calling for their lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that right now as we speak, you're making it obvious to people how to create Sabbath in their lives, that as we speak, you're making it obvious to people that you are pleased with them and that you love them and that you want to be with them because they bring you great joy. Holy Spirit, have your way in our church. In the name of Jesus, we give our life to you. In you, we truly have, are, and experience our being. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.